the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Happy feast. Rosnikum. People of the sun and darkness have seen a great light. And those in the region of shadow of death, light has sprung up. Light is what Christ is. We have that in the Feast of the Transfiguration. Of course, we hear it in Genesis and the creation. Over and over, this theme of light comes up, which implies that there is a darkness. We were sitting in darkness, who have lived in darkness. The Lord has come to bring us out of that darkness. And people that have been locked and confined in a place of darkness for a really long time know the blessings that that is. And it's like some of us that have what we call seasonal affective disorder and don't like the clouds for so long. When the sun shines forth, all of a sudden a little bit of joy comes into our lives. But much greater is when Christ's light comes and breaks through the darkness of our sin. He says Galilee of the Gentiles. St. John Chrysostom says that he is talking about a region around Galilee when Sennacherib had come into the region with the Assyrians that he gave to, of course, the pagans. And they were thriving there. And that's where the Lord was walking at this point, that prophecy of Isaiah refers to that. And they certainly needed the light as well, as because those are our forebears. They needed the light, and were given that light by Christ. And of course the Lord begins his ministry, as we know with the words, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The exact words that we have from John the Baptist. He comes preaching repentance. The one who makes the ways of the Lord straight, who makes his path straight, prepares the way for the coming of the Lord, begins to prepare our hearts for what is needed. And the Lord himself prepares our life for the reception of him, the reception of his light, by telling us first, repent. And Gregory Palamas says that the beginning, the middle, and the end of the spiritual life is repentance. But of course, indeed, there is no end to repentance. We can always change clo closer and closer to the glory of God to be transfigured from glory to glory, as St. Paul says, to continually move toward Christ. As we've said many times, repentance is not some form of, you know, mea culpa, woe is me, beating yourself on the back, I'm terrible, I'm terrible, I'm terrible, and it has its place for a moment, for a moment. But it is meant to change you, to bring us to a change of life. Indeed, what repentance means is a change of news, a change of life, a change of heart. The nia, the word nia, nous, the heart, the spiritual part of the soul changes. When we move closer to Christ, as we know that word amatia, sin, in Greek, means a, a missing the mark. So it's like I've told people in confession many times, and when we come here, we should at least be trying to get closer to the target every time. Instead of the arrow going off at a 90 degree angle somewhere, we should gradually be getting it a little bit closer to the point by changing our life and transfiguring ourselves. That's why we come to confession. But our life has to be one that is seen throughout the hymns in the last few days. We often hear today, and the whole world is gathered, and all of us are gathered. But when the Lord was baptized, and in these passages we're hearing, everybody wasn't there. Who knows how many people were there when he was first baptized? A few hundred, thousand, who knows? But it wasn't the whole world. But in those people were represented all of us. The whole world is represented. And if that's the case, we who bear witness to this coming of the Holy Spirit, to the words of the Father, this is my beloved Son, have a great responsibility. When people see us, do they see that light? If the whole world is seeing this, then the people have to see that in our own lives. Are we being transfigured? Are our lives changed? Are our lives lives of repentance? Do we continue on the same path? As I said in the homily on Thursday, in the early church when we said the newly illumined, we meant the newly illumined. And that threefold spiritual path of the Orthodox Church of purification, illumination, and deification, we meant that the people had already been purified before baptism. The illumination meant that Holy Spirit had come upon them. They had left their big sins. Perhaps those little ones still remain, but they weren't still swimming in them. That's why, ideally, in catechesis, not only do we teach the times and dates and figures and all the things of orthodoxy, but we teach people a way of life, to be disciples of Christ, real disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, who truly believe in the gospel and who are leaving their old way of life behind. If someone comes to the church and is a continuing you know, alcoholic or you know, a fornicator or God knows what, they need to turn away from something so big 
before baptism. That doesn't mean they won't be tempted afterwards. Baptism is not magic. But it does mean that the path should be set toward Christ with the eyes on the prize, to run as, one, as people who want to win the prize, to live that life of the gospel. So there's a big calling for us to change, to live as Christ has called us to live, to turn away from those things and to seek to be real disciples, because we will indeed have to answer for what we have not given. And that wonderful story I've told you before about Pascha heals Wolfman Tom, transforms Wolfman Tom. You might remember Thomas in that story when he goes to confession after many murders and terrible crimes, the priest says to him at the end, it's kind of chilling words, it is your intention to repent of these sins to never turn back to them. That's pretty powerful. Now if I said that to you every time, which I probably should, and to myself as well, think about those words. How often we come up there and say, you know, Father, it's the usual, I do the same things over and over. Because we all do that. We have our passions are our passions. But our intention coming to confession should be, when we come up there, I'm not going to do that again. Or at least I'm going to shed blood and try not to do so, as the saints did. I'm going to be as Mary of Egypt and fall down on the ground in tears, weeping until those thoughts go away. Do we do that? Or do we come there just to fill our requirement, to earn our Holy Communion, in quotes? Do we do that? Just knowing, well, I'm saying this, but I'm going to do it again anyway. I'm supposed to say this, but it's not transfiguring our heart. We should come to confession with the desire to hate the sin. True repentance is a hatred of what we've done before. To turn away from that, from what separates us from God, which breaks that relationship of love, in which he gives us in so much of his great mercy the opportunity to turn back to him. That is repentance. St. Isaac the Syrian, of course, tells us that this life has been given to us for repentance. Do not waste it in vain pursuits. So many things we do are a waste of time. That modern elder Paisius Olaru of Romania constantly says in his book, don't waste time to people. Don't waste time. Because we get to the end of our lives and we look back and my like, gosh, what was I doing that for? All those years. What's it going to do for me now? It goes with my heart. The sins that I have left in my heart stick with my heart because there's no more repentance after death. It's a chilling thing. So we need to work now for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And this is not a great burden. This is not a dark thing. This is the Lord coming to us saying, you see a great light. Isaiah is telling us, we have seen a great light. We have sat in darkness, light has dawned upon us, has sprung up in us. And that light is meant to shine forth within us and give us newness of life, a burden that is not hard to bear, a light and easy yoke, the joy of Christ filling our hearts and spreading out to the whole world. So you hear, I heard someone recently talking about some Protestant of some sect, I don't know which one, saying that they didn't like to use the repentance word repentance anymore because it was scary to people and it was dark and... We, people were really not that bad anyway. They couldn't help the things they were doing. It's the same people that don't use sin. It's the same people that don't use devil in their baptismal services anymore. Many things like that. Because those things are scary to people. It's absurd. It's preposterous. People do need repentance. If they're not preaching repentance, then why did the Lord say it? Then why did John the Baptist say it? God help them. But God help us first. Because we have heard that message. We have heard repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we hear it over and over as an overriding theme in our morning prayers, our evening prayers, throughout the divine services, throughout the week, constantly within the canons of the church. It is repent, repent, repent. So what should we do? Change from this moment, from this day, from this hour, from this minute, as Herman says. Repent. To live the life of the gospel. To not wait till tomorrow. To not wait till this afternoon. We all know what things that are that are troubling our hearts, that we say every time that we walk up to go to confession, that we say in our icon corners, that we feel, that we just pass over sometimes, we're just trying to distract ourselves from them. We don't want to think about that. It hurts too much. It doesn't hurt bad as the results of not doing it. We need to repent because Christ desires to dwell within us. Christ desires to put his kingdom within our hearts. 
to live in our lives, to dwell with us, to abide in us, to be everything for us, to be our love, to be our mercy, to be our joy, to be our kindness, to fill our lives with the life of the gospel, that our very lives walking around might be the gospel. So when people see us, they might say, Behold, a follower of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. Amen.